Currently 75 feet. Guys looking good, down a half. Six forward. Where were you on July 20th, 1969? Well, obviously some of you weren't even born yet, but we were. And I remember being huddled around a television set with some friends, waiting for that signal from astronaut Neil Armstrong. And then finally it happened. <laughs> Houston, the eagle has landed. It's been 50 years since that giant leap for mankind. And this week, we're gonna celebrate it TCR style. I'm Kelly Phillips. And I'm Bob Phillips, and this is Texas Country Reporter. I'm uh, at the foot of the ladder. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man. It's one of the most famous quotes in history. One giant leap for mankind. And Neil Armstrong's iconic words have been replayed countless times. But those few seconds from Apollo 11 are just a sliver of all the radio communication it took to put a man on the moon. Buzz is erecting the solar wind experiment now. While today we do everything, let's say, with text messaging and on our computers, in 1969, the majority of all the work that NASA did for Apollo was actually accomplished through audio. Oh, geez, that's great. Is the lighting halfway decent? Yes, indeed. They've got the flag up now. If anyone knows audio, it's Dr. John Hansen from the University of Texas at Dallas. His department develops intelligent speech recognition software and techniques for analyzing the human voice. And if UTD wouldn't have studied Apollo, then NASA may have lost a piece of history. All of the uh, data was all recorded on analog tape. These tapes were sitting uh, in NASA's uh, uh, archive. They've never been digitized. If we weren't going to digitize them, they probably would deteriorate and be lost forever. Anything more before I head on up, Bruce? The negative, head on up the ladder, Buzz. This is uh, one of the tapes. You know, you gotta be careful when you take them out. Uh, you know, this is the uh, storage piece. It looks like an old uh, piece of tape like we used to use in television. Exactly, yes. Before John and his students could study the mission control audio, they had to digitally record the obsolete reel-to-reel -reel tapes. There's 30 tracks on this tape. Anyone that's in mission control who has a headset on and who's talking, uh, they would be recorded on this. How long is each tape? Each tape is roughly about 14 hours in length. And how many of these are there? Uh, there's many. After about four months of digitizing, we were able to get 19,000 hours digitized. With the digital recordings in hand, John's department used their voice recognition software to transcribe every word said. Now they're sharing that text and audio data worldwide to advance speech technology and help NASA plan for the future. Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, all of these companies, there's lots of universities also that are looking at advancing speech technology. And we think this will actually help NASA better understand group dynamics for a mission to Mars. And long after that work is done, the digital archive that UTD created will far outlast those fragile and historic tape reels at NASA. This has become much more than a research project for Dr. Hansen and his students. It's their way to preserve the voices of hundreds of other brilliant minds at the edge of the scientific frontier. We're just geeky engineers, but we really, really had a great time with this. And I'll say, it just we feel really happy that uh, a lot of people that really worked hard to accomplish this engineering feat will be remembered. Houston, Roger, well done, huh?
In the Army, though, I did some medical photography and some other stuff, but uh, mostly things that I did on my own. Just went around shooting pretty pictures and things. Oh, that's nice. Terry Slazak has been a shutter bug for his entire adult life. He's gone from darkroom to digital, and these days it's pretty easy to snap pictures of the wildlife around his hill country home. But he remembers how much harder things were 60 years ago when the photos he printed were out of this world. I was the first photographer hired uh, in the what was to become the photo division at NASA. When John Glenn went up, he shot a whole lot of pictures of the Earth's limb, the color bands of, around the Earth, and we printed what we call a ring around, and uh, he came and picked out a set of these, which is as close as what he could remember that they looked like. Because before John Glenn orbited the Earth, nobody knew what those colors were. No. As NASA launched astronauts to places no one had ever been, they brought back priceless images no one had ever seen. Mercury, Gemini, the Space Shuttle, Shepard, Glenn, Lovell, think of nearly any NASA achievement from the first several decades of spaceflight. If you can picture it, chances are Terry helped in some way to make that picture. Is this where you have all of your pictures? Well, look at this. No, no, this isn't all of them. This is only Just a very that. small part. Here's Columbia. This is the first untethered uh, man. This is Bruce McCandless. <laughs> I talked to Bruce afterwards. I said, weren't you a little frightened out there, you know, when you got so far away from the shuttle? And he says, I was just hoping this damn thing works. <laughs> What's this one? That is Buzz Aldrin on the moon, and that is Neil Armstrong on the moon. That's the picture of Neil that Armstrong on the, the moon. The picture, yeah. Does it feel like 50 years? No. Does it feel like yesterday? Uh, not, not too long ago, you know, really. But it doesn't seem like 50 years, my goodness. <laughs> By the time the Apollo program was underway, Terry was used to handling historic images in the photo department. But then the NASA brass threw him a curveball. See, starting with the first moon landing, all film had to be sterilized before it could come out of quarantine. And they only trusted one person in the universe to do it. By virtue of that, uh, I became the guy who went into quarantine. You were in quarantine with the astronauts? Yeah. After they came back? Yeah, I was in quarantine for Apollo 11, 12, 13, and 14. For each mission, Terry spent a month sealed up with the astronauts in the Lunar Receiving Lab. He was one of the first people to spend time with Michael Collins, Neil Armstrong, and Buzz Aldrin after we put a man on the moon. But humble photographer Terry Slazak has his own world's first moment from Apollo 11. He was unloading the film when it happened. I got Magazine S out. The first thing I thought about, there's all this dust all over it. The first thing I thought about, if this stuff has gotten in this magazine, it has scratched the film something terrible, you know? And that was my thought. But then everybody says, well, what is that? I said, it's moon dust. It's the only place it's been, you know? They said, oh. Well, you're the first one to t touch the moon dust. With your bare hands? Yeah. And so anyway, they said, well, hold up your hand. So I hold up my hand, and I have a picture of it there somewhere, and I got all this little black dust on it. Well, Terry's historic encounter with the remnants of the moon may have been an accident, but his years of dedication certainly were not. He worked tirelessly behind the scenes alongside so many others for one reason, to inspire us all to greater heights. What do you think is the importance of all these pictures to the rest of the world? 
would they do for us? Well, I think that uh, it shows that we're not bound to the earth for the rest of our days. The offshoot of the space program, though, has brought uh, a whole lot of new discoveries in, in many, many fields. Do you ever, on a clear night, ever go out and just look up at the moon and think, I've, I've touched your dust. <laughs> I've, had, I've had you on my hands. No, you know? It's like... Uh, Neil Armstrong told me, you know, one time he says, uh, he says, whenever you go out and look at the moon, just wink at it and say, you know, we've been there. Over the years, there were several people who headed up NASA's programs. One of them, though, was a quiet, humble man named George Abbey, who some people actually refer to as Mr. NASA, even though he really doesn't like that name. Still, George Abbey's contributions to the space program are huge and can't be denied. As a matter of fact, he's back at NASA in an effort to change some things back to the way they used to be. I think the Longhorns represent a great history here in Texas and have been a great part of the state and its development over the years, and they are part of our history. These animals are real survivors, aren't they? Absolutely, and uh, that's why they took off in Texas, because uh, they could survive in that kind of a environment. and. Uh, they have provided a, a mainstay for Texas for many, many years. I guess you could call him the cow boss in these parts. George Abbey shows off this barn and set of pens just outside Houston, Texas. It's a busy place with 4-H members and volunteers working this established herd of registered purebred Texas Longhorns. Well, it'd be safe to say there is no other livestock operation in the world quite like this one. And without a doubt, there is no other herd of cattle anywhere sharing a pasture with human space exploration. I always had an attraction for Longhorns, and when I was in the Air Force, I flew over this land here, and I can remember there wasn't anything here, but there were Longhorns here when I first saw this land. And I knew that we had these 1,600 acres here and we weren't using all that land. The thought occurred to me that maybe we could reestablish Longhorn cattle. Yep, it's the same George Abbey who's been called the astronaut maker. In fact, that's the title of his biography. I didn't like that title. I hated that title. I didn't want that title. I did everything I could to prevent them from using that title, so don't give me credit for that. He was an Air Force test pilot who rose through the ranks to be the director of the Johnson Space Center. But as a boy, George Abbey simply wanted to be a farmer. His affection for Longhorns evolved after seeing images of grazing cattle in old photos of this area before the Johnson Space Center ever existed. And shortly before retirement, Mr. Abbey started the livestock operation here at NASA, sharing the land with massive artifacts of human achievement. And this is a Saturn V. Wow, <laughs> look how big it is. It's, it is big. This is a flight Saturn V uh, launch vehicle. Uh, it's a real launch vehicle. It was built to fly uh, missions to the moon. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. 
What was that moment like when Neil Armstrong's words came back at that moment? What was that like? Oh, a great relief because uh, he was almost out of fuel uh, when he landed. So the fact that he had landed successfully and was there, uh, you got a great sense of relief. You weren't really completely uh, feeling that you were, uh, it wasn't over because you didn't get, to, you hadn't got him back yet. That's one small step for man. Were you holding your breath the whole time? Yes. One giant leap for mankind. We mounted a television camera on the side of the lunar module that the, the astronauts actuated and went down so we could actually view them on the surface of the moon. And that was a, a picture taken with that television camera and it's been color enhanced. It's one of those moments that everyone remembers where they were on that hot July night, a half a century ago. For Kelly and me, we can't help but be struck by the thought that this humble man can wander through a crowd totally unnoticed, a man whose brush with history is so profound. So you'd be satisfied with saying you're, you were a part of a great I was, team? I was fortunate to be part of a great team, very fortunate and blessed to be part of a great team. Yeah, that's true. The space age is no longer that thing to come, it's here. If the Navy and aviation are in George Abbey's blood, his bones are space and rocketry. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that true, is that an accurate state? Uh, that might be that might be true. Yes, That's probably, probably probably there's some truth in that. <laughs> You're a humble man. Do you know that? Well, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I don't mean to be a humble man. I I just don't think, you know. I I, uh, I was a part of something. Not not. A, I didn't. Certainly, one individual doesn't make something happen. Hard to believe 50 years have passed since that monumental moment in world history. It gave George Abbey the momentum to carry his vision forward to the space shuttle program, the International Space Station, and beyond. But it was always in the back of his mind that cattle should be returned to this leftover pasture at NASA. And today, while scientists here plot the course of the future, Part of George Abbey's legacy is making sure the past is honored and guarded as well. For a man that wanted to be a farmer, <laughs> you, you've kind of be, literally been to the moon and back, at least philosophically. Yes. And, but here you are back, back here with a bunch of longhorns. Uh, that's true. And uh, I feel good about having them here. And, I feel good about not only my involvement with the space program, but also my involvement as, uh, in this project. I've had a, a lot of great experiences over time, and uh, not a lot of people can say that, but again, I feel very blessed that I've had that, so you can't ask for much more than that.